What we're going to be doing today is we've spent a bit of time talking about、um, ethnonyms and exonyms, the politics of naming with regard to Malay Muslims in Thailand, the way in which ethnonyms have changed over the years. In previous lectures, we've talked about how everyone from Bangkok referred to these as Kat. Others refer to them as Malay, and then、um, lots of different、um, ethnonyms were used. Orang Jawi were used.、Um, Thai Muslims、uh, were introduced by the government in the 1930s. Many of you will know that there is a、uh, big controversy about.、Um, uh, Muslims from Rakhine State、um, that have for many years、um, been、uh, marginalised by Rakhine Buddhists and by、um, Yangon, and that many have left in boats as refugees,、um, and that just very recently up to a million have、um, are now refugees in eastern Bangladesh. And this, like all complex, is very complex.、Uh, Rakhine is a very、uh, poor state.、Uh, Rakhine was subjugated by Rangoon,、uh, by the Burmese,、um, the Buddhist rulers, the the artifact, the artifacts,、um, the rulers themselves were sent into exile. The artifacts. Which the nation was proud around, that was centered to its symbolic potency, were taken from Rakhine and taken to Yangon.、Uh, Rakhine is is resource poor. It is far away from Yangon. It was once a semi-independent polity,、uh, state like、um, like Bhutani and like so many other、um, parts of mainland Southeast Asia. And、um, Buddhist Buddhist populations existed for many years, although these populations came and went. But the the controversy、um, has got the present controversy has many aspects to it, and one of them、uh, revolves around、um, how Rakhine Muslims are named, what ethnonym. Is used. There was a census done in Myanmar recently, and the official census only allowed Muslims the opportunity of being called Bengali, and many Muslims refused to answer that census, saying, "We are not Bengali.、Uh, I am Burmese Muslim, or、um, I'm Rohingya. There are Karen Muslims in in Thailand as well." Now. Um, below here, you will see links, and one link is to a YouTube、um, video by this man, Jacques Lader, and he is a historian who works on、uh, Rakhine, and he has、um, done many、um, uh, written many articles about Rakhine Muslims, Rakhine State, but Rakhine Muslims.、Um, And he has contributed a chapter to、uh, the Oxford Research Encyclopedia of Asian History, and his、uh, he has a chapter, an article in it called Rohingya: The History of a Muslim Identity in Myanmar. And I just want to go very briefly through this with you. We'll go into full screen now, and so that you can read it a lot easier. Yeah, in the late. In the late 1950s, Muslim leaders and students in northern、uh, Arakan, which is、uh, was changed to Rakhine State in 1989, began to use the term Rohingya to assert a distinct ethno-religious identity from the region's Muslim community, as distinct from majority Buddhist the majority Buddhist population. To which the term Rakhine usually refers. In the 1960s, Muslim authors of Rohingya pamphlets were keenly aware of how novel their chosen、uh, 
uh, 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 um, the, this, uh, their chosen term was uh, for the Burmese public at the time. The use of the name spread widely in international media after riots in Rakhine State in 1912 when Rohingyas, Rakhine Muslims, became worldly, widely known internationally as a state-oppressed Muslim minority. The term Rohingya embodies an ongoing process of identity formation that has unified Muslim communities in the northern Rakhine region with a similar cultural profile but a diverse historical background. At the same time, Myanmar officials reject Rohingya as an ethnic uh, domination, denomination as they reject the legitimacy of the post-colonial Rohingya move movement of political emancipation, aiming at the creation of an autonomous Muslim region in northern Rakhine. So anthropological fieldwork to investigate uh, Rohingya as culturally distinct Muslim communities is rare and access is limited. Background information in the media after 2012 is mainly based on Rohingya public presentations of their own identity, although extant sources suggest a history of multi-layered communities and the formation of a Rohingya ethno-political movement as a response to political and social challenges after 1948. At its origins, the Rohingya identity claims can be understood as a narrative context that in includes the simultaneous rise of Rakhine Buddhist nationalism in the 1950s and later on political oppression and impoverishment that constrained the lives of both Buddhists and Muslims between 1962 and 2011. Like most terms denoting social identity, ethnonyms, Rohingya is an unstable signifier denoting the um, point, uh, potentially pointing to various features of stigmatization. Today, this term clearly operates inside a historical process of ethnic ethnicalization amongst Muslims in Rakhine, in addition to the early 20th century, worldwide media reports have signified the Rohingya as being stateless victims of systemized oppression, whose refugee status and disenfranchisement are defining elements of their public identity. Okay, so uh, I recommend um, this is another interesting um, this is another interesting case study of ethnogenesis. Uh, this is another reminder that ethnonyms are important and. Please take the time to listen to Jacques Leder's presentation. You will see that there is the option to be reading subtitles as well, which may uh, help you. Remember also that you are able to slow down the speed. I'll show you. Remember that you can slow down the speed with which you listen, so you can go to normal speed and you can slow it down. So remember, remember that you are able that you are able to, in some YouTube videos, both um, click for uh, subtitles, and in some you can go and you can um, slow down the speed, and also here you also have opportunities to open a transcript. And so here you will see a transcript of the things that have been said 
which means that you are able to potentially, you could click on that and you can copy and you can paste that word into a dictionary. And so let's begin to use YouTube as a powerful learning tool, not just as a um, not just as a toy. So I hope you enjoy reading this article, and I hope that you enjoy listening to the speech.